Hello and welcome to Innovation Celebration, the show where we celebrate advancements in science and technology, the people and ideas to make them possible, and the ways in which they enhance human flourishing. I am Angelica Walkerworth, and this is, as of two weeks ago, my husband, Thomas Walkerworth. And today we're going to be talking about water. So water is obviously something that is essential for our survival. Obviously, we need to drink it, we need to use it to grow our food, we use it for hygiene and sanitation. Uh, but humans have also figured out how to use water to do a number of other really useful things for our flourishing. Uh, one of the perhaps more obvious ones is hydroelectric electric power, which we're actually not going to go into in this episode because we're going to do a power generation episode in the near future here. Um, but we will be covering some other things like transport and stuff like that. But we're going to start out with water for drinking and um, for hygiene. Yeah, so... Um... You know, things are a lot better now than they were for a lot of history in terms of how much clean water people have access to or just how much water people have access to generally. You know, um, in, through the Middle Ages and, and, you know, over the last few centuries, it was really the situation that m the majority of people didn't have access to good quality water. There also, you know, until the until the, after the Renaissance, really, there, there wasn't an attitude of, of hygiene generally. Uh, Johann Norberg talks about this in his book Progress. There was, you know, a, a lot of the time having a bath was seen as a weird thing to do. Like it, almost, it could identify you as a witch even at some point in history or, you know, it was just... Or as the wrong religion. Certain religions had bathing uh, yeah. as part of their... Yeah, and like, religions. you know, the, the, the aristocracy might have a bath once a month. And um, but you know generally it just wasn't a thing, and um, and you know there were some limited techniques for cleaning water which you're going to talk about, but um, but there really just wasn't access to good clear water until um, until the, sort of the industrial revolution really kicked in, and it's just improved continuously since then um, to a situation now where in most of the world you know access to clean water is something you take for granted. There's still a lot of parts of the world though where that's not the case, and it's actually uh, still around a billion people who don't have access to to clean water. And around two million who die every year from water-related illnesses. So um, you know, there's, there's still a, a lot of work for um, sort of you know innovation and technology to do in, in changing that situation. And this is mostly in you know obviously the most disadvantaged parts of the world, Africa and parts of East Asia, um, areas where uh, the weather also makes access to clean water difficult. There's very hot parts of the world. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do there, but there are barriers, you know, social barriers, you know, despotic governments and things like that that make improving that hard. Um, I just wanted to say as well that that's kind of surprising considering how much water there is on Earth. Like, you know, it may seem like you know, 70% of the world's surface is covered in water. Why can't we get water to people? But only 3% of that is fresh water. Most of it is saline, you know, salt-laden seawater that's not safe for humans to drink. So we'll, we'll come on to that problem as well in a bit. But do you want to talk about some of those early ways of cleaning water? Yeah, so although people didn't have very sophisticated methods for cleaning water, they did recognize that, you know, certain people, you know, people who drank certain types of water died. Water that looked unclean or smelled bad probably wasn't safe or enjoyable to drink. Um, and so going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians, people figured out a few different methods. And these were the ones that were used for most of history by... You know, the ones we have evidence for, there could have been other civilizations using other methods, but there were a few common methods um, that were basically filtering through gravel or rocks, um, heating the water in some way, boiling it, or putting it on the sun, or, or whatever the case may be, or adding herbs to it. Um, because certain plants have antimicrobial properties, so by you know putting the antimicrobial plants crushed up into the water, then you were killing off the germs that were in them. So, And some of these still get used, like you and I stayed in a uh, well, sort of not an Airbnb, but like a similar setup um, a couple of weeks ago, and the shower there was transparent, and it had these rocks inside the shower head that were yeah. presumably doing something Filtering. to yeah. to filter the water. Yeah, and so these were these techniques were used by the ancient Egyptians. They were mentioned in the Bible. They were used by the Greeks and the Romans. The Mayans used volcanic rock to filter their water. And um, one significant innovation that we see relatively early on in human history was an Arabian chemist named Gerber who uh, wrote in the 9th century AD, and Gerber wrote about something called a wick siphon, which is basically using capillary action from water. So if you remember from science class, if you dip like a paper towel or something in water, the water will creep up the paper towel because of capillary action. So this device uses the same principle, um, where you have 
your dirty water that needs to be cleaned in one container is slightly higher than an empty container, and you put a rag from one to the other, and so the water will climb up the rag, and then, because of gravity, will drip into the other container that's lower than it, and thus fill it up with water. But just the water comes with, not the toxins or dirt or whatever else. They get stuck on the rag, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, or in the old jar. And interestingly, this is actually the reason I was able to see very well how this works is because people still teach this as a survival technique. If you're out and, you know, stuck somewhere, uh, like they teach it to the military, the Boy Scouts, that um, this is a way to get clean water if you don't have it. And so people have videos online of how this works. Um, Wick siphon, that's called. But then the probably biggest step forward to... The Western world having access to clean water uh, came in Scotland in 1804 when a civil engineer named Robert Tom, spelled T-H-O-M for some reason. I can't stand that when people <laughs> spell my name with an H when it's just Tom. It's, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's his last name, but still. A Scotsman named Robert Tom, who is a civil engineer, and he specialized in projects relating to water. He developed an aqueduct and a few other ways of moving water to where it was needed. Um, and in 1804, they a, a town in Scotland adopted his plan for a municipal water treatment that was still using that same technique of filtering through gravel, um, but was cleaning water for the whole town and then delivering it to the residents of that town via horse and cart. Cool. So precursor to our modern water treatment plants that you have in pretty much all developed world. Sure. So, I mean, yes, it, he's, uh, I think, sort of owe a lot to him for pioneering that and um, and you know has played a large role in, in getting the west as clean as it is water wise and um, and I want to kind of uh, highlight somebody right now who's doing the same thing um, that might address some of what I was talking about earlier those parts of the world where you know that kind of infrastructure just isn't present and uh, this is Yu Hong Guao I think I'm saying their name right um, a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin it's a university we seem to call out quite a lot um, who was actually working on a completely different project uh, but invented this hydrogel tablet um, which is a tablet that you just drop into water uh, and it produces hydrogen peroxide in the water and um, as it pretty much in, like was it 99.999 percent efficacy yeah, at, a few at, at clearing bacteria bacteria out of the water um so there's still some work to do on seeing if this can be developed for clearing other things like viruses but bacterial infections are really the main thing that gets transmitted through dirty water mm -hmm. so um uh, this was part founded by the uh, camille and henry dreyfus foundation uh, who are an organization that fund chemistry projects and um and uh, Johan Gua was assisted by professors and, and other students um but the it's really cool this tablet because it's super cheap like it's cheap to produce and then you don't need to put any energy in you don't need to you know um catalyze the reaction or anything like that you just drop it in it it, it does it straight away and it doesn't produce any byproducts and how much water can it clean at a time uh, so one tablet does one liter roughly oh, okay. so um you know if you just get a bunch of these out and people can just drop them in buckets and uh, and you sure, know yeah. so you know that's it's exactly the kind of innovation that is going to make a massive difference in those parts of the world. Absolutely. So I say that, yeah, there's no byproducts. There's nothing left on the container afterwards. There's no harmful gases or anything given off. So it's just a really straightforward, you know, a bit like those medicines that you drop in a bottle of water and it just... Fizzes, fizzes up and does yeah. the thing, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, another group that's working to um, ensure access to clean water and improve hygiene and sanitation is called Wash Benefits. And this is a group that functions in Kenya and Bangladesh primarily. And they're interested not um, specifically in improving access to clean water and sanitation with the purpose of reducing child mortality and illnesses among children in those two countries. And they're interested in doing it in as, efficient way, as efficiently as possible. So they do regular studies of what they've been doing and what those effects have been. And in a recent review of their efforts in Kenya, they found one method that was just head and shoulders above the rest having a major impact on reducing child mortality in the villages where it had been tried, and that is providing chlorination stations. So chlorination for water treatment in the Western world has been in use for more than a century. Um, so, well, and in, you know, we all know of it as being the thing in swimming pools that yeah, gives them that yeah, ice stinging weird feeling. Right, yeah. that's a higher amount than what you would use to clean water. Um, and obviously straight chlorine is actually quite toxic for humans, but... In small amounts, it is really beneficial at killing 
uh, pathogens. And so the U.S. adopted it in the early 1900s when we were dealing with a lot of typhoid outbreaks, typhoid fever outbreaks. And chlorinating water was really effective at ending that. Um, And so now in Kenya, they're finding the same thing, that if you put near existing water sources, such as wells, a chlorination station that gives a pre-measured amount of chlorine that people can put in their water, people use it because it's convenient. They use the right amount because it's pre-measured. And then the effect is that it reduces the deaths of children under five by about 63%. Wow. And relatively cheaply. And they estimate that the cost to chain to save a life is $1,941. And at first I was like, wait, that's cheap. <laughs> but then I thought about, you know, how much are you spending in the Western world um, on your health care? You're, you're probably spending more than $2,000 every couple of years, whether you're paying it directly or through health insurance or through taxes. However you're paying for your health care, you're probably hitting $2,000 in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, just for normal healthcare things that, that come up. So to save a life for less than $2,000 actually is quite good. Yeah, especially when you think about how much money you know we spend on just raising a child. Yeah. You know, it runs into the tens, if not hundreds of thousands over the course of a you know child's upbringing. Mm-hmm. But, so um, thus far, we've really been talking about fresh water and, uh, and just trying to improve access to that. But as I say, 97% of the water on Earth's surface is seawater, salt water. And... Um, you know, it, it's tempting, really, if particularly if you're in a sort of desert climate, um, to look at the sea and think, well, there's some water. Why can't we use that? Um, so it's not a new idea, desalinating water, taking the salt out of it and, and making it, just sort of converting it into fresh water. Uh, Francis Bacon, way back in 1671, uh, saw some um, sh- uh, seamen doing this with um, just using running seawater through stones to, to make it drinkable. Unfortunately... Didn't seem to capture the actual process there. but No, he, he designed his own process, but as far as I could tell, he never tested it. Yeah, so um, there's maybe a missed opportunity there. Um, but uh, modern desalination, desalination um, started to be developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, there's a couple of different processes that he used. And really sort of divided into two camps, uh, distillation and reverse osmosis. And, uh, and distillation is a process that anyone who's done chemistry at school or university should, um, may be familiar with, uh, you know, it's the process that you use to separate two things, two um, compounds or, or uh, elements that are in a mixture together. So, um, you know, there's a number of different ways of doing it and there's different distillation methods that are used in desalination. One is heat, for example, where if you heat up the mixture, you know, different things come out at different boiling points. So that's a way of separating them. You can do it as well by putting, uh, having a reaction where there's a, a third element in play and um, so you know one part binds to the new thing instead of what it what it's bound, bound to at the right moment so there's, there's several different ways of doing that um pressure and things and there's a lot of different kinds of distillation and then there's a whole other um, field of, of desalination which is reverse osmosis which is mm-hmm. passing the water through filters um that can so osmosis is the process by which plants take water in but reverses by you know, pushing it out through a through a membrane um, that catches the, the elements that you don't want, mainly the salt, but um, other stuff as well. Um, but there's drawbacks to that, which I'll explain in a moment. Yeah, and so this can be really useful. Obviously, it's it's not cheap, as you're talking about. All those methods require energy input, so it does require a fair bit of investment. But one country that's doing it pretty successfully is Israel. Israel, of course, is a relatively small country with a lot of coastline, um, but they also don't have a lot of fresh water and yet have managed to make a really fertile country where they can you know, support a lot of people and grow a lot of crops. Um, they, they actually have the saltiest body of water in the world. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yet they're managing to use desalination um, to get about 80% of their drinking water uh, because they have, they're using reverse osmosis desalination like you were talking about. They have the world's largest reverse osmosis desalination plant. Um, and the, the plus side of that, like I said, is it's providing most of their drinking water. They're actually starting to produce so much fresh water that they might be able to export it to the surrounding regions if the surrounding regions decide to trade with them. Which, yeah, they're, they're sort of surrounded by countries that won't trade with them, even though um, Lebanon's in the middle of dealing with you know wildfires and things like that where that, you know more water would be helpful. But, um, yeah, at least yeah, they might be able to export it to other countries further afield. Mm-hmm. You know, they are trading with the UAE now, which is somewhere else that's been researching Desalination, desalination as well, yeah. you know, another desert country right next to the sea. Right, right. Um, yeah, so they have managed to do a lot, which is really impressive, but they are dealing with some of the challenges that come with desalination, especially with having large plants like that. Yeah, um, so 
both of the techniques I talked about um, present problems. Uh, cost is usually the overriding objection to desalination, and that's because if, if you're doing distillation, then you either need to be generating a lot of heat or bring in you know, a chemical reaction that requires another input. Um, so these are all expensive things, or pushing through the filters. The problem with that system is, A, you need a lot of power to push the water through the filters in the first place, uh, and then B, you end up with a lot of microbes and, and just general gunk collecting on the filters that then needs to be dealt with and got rid of. Um, so you need to be sterilized so that you're not putting the water through this you know, in infected, <laughs> basically, filter. Uh, there's other disadvantages as well. Um, brine is, is the byproduct of this process, which is just extremely salty water, basically. And you've got to dispose of that somehow, just dumping it back into the sea um, has an effect on fish stocks. So, so it reduces the oxygen in the water, which kills yeah. the fish, which is especially a concern when you're talking about coastal communities that tend to depend on fishing. Yeah. And um, and then also, uh, yeah, that's that's the main thing, wasn't it? Yeah, the um, the microbes was the other issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh yeah, sorry, the, the other thing is that it needs to be located by the sea. So it's not really useful if you've got a large country where most of the population is away from, all of the population is away from the coast. Indeed. You can obviously pipe water over to places, but then that's another. That's another cost, cost yeah. yeah. Uh, and more infrastructure you have to build to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's... There are challenges. Now, one interesting innovation is trying to deal with most of those challenges. It doesn't address the brine issue, but it does address some of the others. So this is called the Epicuro Solar Desalinator, which sounds like a device out of science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> the Desalinator 3000. <laughs> but it's developed by a British company called Epicuro, which is named after the Greek philosopher Epicurus. Um, and they're dedicated to solving some of the world's biggest problems through innovation. So might try to get one of them on the show some one of these days. But um, this particular device is meant for a single family to use, basically. So it's not a giant desalination plant. It's something that one or two people could easily move by themselves. And we'll link in the show notes there are videos of, of two guys moving one together. And basically, it can desalinate water, but it can also clean dirty water. So if you're near another water source that's just not fantastic, you can just use that to clean your water as well. As the name suggests, it's solar powered, so you're not, um, so a you're not adding additional energy costs or you know difficulties there. But b this also works better in sunny areas, which isn't so much a problem because those tend to be the areas that lack water anyway. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, it can clean about forty liters a day a single unit. So the idea is a single family would have it, you know, in their backyard or whatever, and use that to clean water every day or two for them to use in their house, um, but you could also link together multiple units to, for a small farm. Um, and the research for this, the, these aren't in production yet. Um, they've created a few prototypes and tested them. They work pretty well. This is, took multiple iterations. You know, innovation tends to take time to develop properly. I mean, how many times did it take for Thomas Edison to develop the light bulb, right? Yeah. Um, but these iterations and research and development were paid for by a uh, British businessman by the name of Howard Raymond. So. Cool. Really cool innovation to address some uh, water shortage issues there. Um, and then there's another one in India you want to talk about. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to tie together a lot of what we've already talked about and move us on to where we're going next all in sure, one with yeah. this next one. Um, because this is something that brings together history and present day and also um, deals with water for drinking like we've been talking about, but also water for other uses, um, which we're going to come on to. So um, in India, there's been a, a charity called the Agar Khan Trust for Culture, a, a non-profit organization that um, was specializing in uh, restoring and excavating uh, what are called baulis or buaris. Uh, and these are sort of known in the West as step wells. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these are very old, these 1500 year old um, they're called wells, but what they really are, they're gigantic holes in the ground. So if you imagine like, you know, a well, as we understand the concept in the West, is this sort of tube that goes into the ground that you drop a bucket down. These things are huge excavations and they have steps down the side. So they're like gigantic, you know, sort of... You walk down into them, right? Cubic, yeah, uh, chasms almost. Um, some of them are bigger than others, like the smaller ones, but um, the largest one they found has 3,200 steps down it. Uh, but they'd been abandoned and forgotten about and you know, trees had fallen into them, dirt had fallen into them, just general trash. And so when they were digging into them, they weren't expecting the effects, expecting to find fragments, you know, bits and pieces. But what they've actually dug out is complete, intact, you know, waterproof surfaces, paved surfaces. This is 1500 years ago, but... Imagine um, the engineering skill that had to go into that. Yeah. 
Um, and India's going through a lot of droughts at the moment. The population's increasing dramatically there. So they're dealing with more and more water shortages. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, they're digging out these cent- uh, millennia and a half old, you know, wells. And they're like, well, hang on. You know, could, could we actually bring these into operation? And that's what they're doing. And, uh, and the way these work is they collect rainwater at the base of them and then yeah, they fill up gradually, ideally. The more fill up they are, the better. But even when they're lower, because you've got the steps down the side, you can just walk down and, yeah. and get the water. from. And, and they have a couple of other benefits as well. They're actually, because they're so deep, some of them, it's colder at the base than it is at the surface and people shelter in them from the heat. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, I'll read out a little quote um, from uh, Vikramit Singh Rupre, who's working with the Agar, Aga Khan Trust. Uh, he says, um, after restoration, the Purana Quila Bauli has so much water that the entire lawns of the old fort in Delhi are being irrigated by it. So they're using this restored step well to provide water for irrigating lawns so that water that was being used for that could be used for drinking. Sure. So, um, you know, it just shows that you know, there's other things that you need to be able to do. Uh, they've actually been really successful. They've restored 15 of them in the city of Delhi alone. Well, that's including some that are still being done. Um, but that's less than $60,000 to do that. And uh, and that supplies another 33,000 gallons <laughs> to the city. And uh, the Turji step well in the desert city of Jodhpur uh, has, is producing 6.2 million gallons. Uh, and one other cool thing about the step wells is they're actually more efficient than nature is at getting water into the water table from rain. Because if you remember your water cycle from, from high school, or probably from earlier than that, um, you know, the rain falls down and, and it seeps into the ground. And then that's where you get your water table underground. That's what wells are for is to you know, extract that. But uh, these actually push the water into the ground more effectively. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it improves the general water table in the area as well. So what a cool way that uh, archaeology has been used to yeah. rediscover an old innovation. Yeah, I was going to say, this is actually a really interesting intersection of different fields again. Like, mm-hmm. you know, how uh, a really an interesting way in which archaeology has a, has benefits for, for the modern day. Sometimes you rediscover practices that are actually quite useful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will obviously, you know, make a huge difference to the lives of people in, in India. And so you were talking about those step wells being used for irrigation. So that's where I wanted to go next with our discussion of water and how it's used to support humans. So besides drinking, the other major use that we have for survival for water is is irrigating to grow crops. Um, and people have been doing this since at, le- at least 6,000 BC. And that's the oldest that we have evidence of. Uh, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Mesopotamians um, would basically just take what they had and bring it one step further. So if you remember your, uh, again, if you remember from school, the Egyptians lived by the Nile, the Nile would flood, you know, periodically. I think it was certain months during the year. And they dug canals and reservoirs and dams and things to just extend the area that they could go crops in with that flood water. And they did the same in Mesopotamia with the Tigris and Euphrates with their flood waters, just extending what, like, where the fertile land was by digging canals and things. Um, the Assyrians, who came along a little bit later, around 900 to 600 BC, also um, took that one step further. And rather than just building canals from existing rivers, they actually tapped into certain underground water sources, which we do all the time now. Um, but this is one of the earliest examples of it, where they would dig tunnels from an underground water source, say, in a hill, and channel that water to their fields where they were needing water to grow crops. Um, and then, as you might expect, when the Romans came along, they brought it up another notch. Yeah, I, I mean, Roman engineering is is a phenomenal thing. Like, if you um, look at a lot of Roman architecture and, and, and engineering, it, it could be from, you know, two millennia later than it is. And uh, and they built networks of dams, reservoirs, and aqueducts um, that both supplied water for irrigating fields and water for city use. And uh, and their aqueducts are some of their most impressive Architectural. Can't grounds. see a lot of them still today, can't you? Yeah, I've seen two myself. There's um, one in Montpellier in France and, and one in uh, Istanbul. Uh, both of them are just incredible. And they, they, they work on a gravity principle, so there's a slight incline usually, and, and the water runs down from you know, sort of a mountain or something where there's a spring into a city where it can be put to use. Sure. And uh, they supplied water for drinking and also for public fountains and public baths. The Romans love their public baths. Uh, we're hoping to see one in a couple of weeks. And they were building those from 312 BC through to about 226 AD. Uh, there was a period in, in, in the 3rd century where um, the Roman Empire kind of almost fell apart because of a lot of infighting. And unfortunately, that kind of, you know, wasting energy on, on wars and, and, you know, who's emperor and who's not takes 
the tension away from innovation and, and that's kind of what brought that great era to an end um but uh thankfully we're now in an era of, irri- of Im- immigra- immigration <laughs> innovation again and um and one of those things is, is archaeology like i was just talking about and cambridge university students um digging on the edge of cambridge have actually found the oldest example of roman irrigation in a field um in 2014 uh, this uh, field they've dug up uh, from about 70 to 120 AD um, has a grid of channels running through it with uh, uh, wells, deep wells around the edges that feed, feeding those channels. So um, the Romans are irrigating even in Britain where you know, there's a lot of rain um, because that actually enabled them to grow a wider range of crops than they could here otherwise. So sure, yeah. they were bringing things with them from, from the continent and finding ways to make them grow here. And I think that's one of the coolest things you can do with irrigation is actually expand the range of what, can, what grow. can grow where well and when you can grow it because yeah. you know, a lot of countries have rainier seasons and less rainy seasons so you need to deal with that yeah um, it's a good example of, of human environment hacking where we you know whatever the environment may be in a particular area we find ways to grow other things there anyway yeah yeah so i mean that's really the whole project of, of irrigation isn't it of expanding how much we can grow what we can grow where we can grow it um and so the other thing that we want to talk about besides you know infrastructure like canals and and wells and aqueducts is you also have certain devices to help with irrigation and so some of those earliest devices you have the ancient Egyptian Egyptians used what were called shadufs I think that's how you say it um, and they were kind of just poles on with buckets on one end and counterweights on the other but it really did save a lot of labor so how they worked is the farmer would pull the a rope while the bucket was over a water source you know canal, river, whatever, um, and that would fill the bucket up with water, and they would swing the pole around to where the water was needed, pull the rope again, and the water would empty over the part of the field where it was needed. So I'm, I'm kind of imagining like what we would call a JCB here, or what you call a backhoe, where you, you know, you, it digs a, a load of earth, swings around, drops it, swings back, you know, sort of an early version of a mechanical arm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that is kind of the basic concept. <laughs> um, obviously, very early version of it. And, you know, even though it was only saving some labor, it was still, you know, rather than having to go and carry the water, it was saving a lot of time in that regard. Um, and then another kind of more high-tech version of some of these canals we were talking about is called canets, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Um, and these were developed by the Persians. And so they're, again, tapping into an underground water source. But rather than just digging a tunnel from the water source to where you want to irrigate... They also had they had that part, but they also had um, shafts to get to the uh, the water for ventilation, for cleaning, for accessing the water from somewhere else. Whatever there are multiple purposes, and a lot of these canets are actually still in use today. So, also excellent part, uh, excellent engineering work on the part of the Persians there. But modern irrigation, uh, we have a number of options for, it and more precision, generally speaking. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a whole range of, of techniques that are used nowadays to irrigate. Some of them are quite low-tech and have been around for a long time. The most obvious is just manual irrigation of just walking across the field and you're pouring water on things. Um, but there's there's some you know, sort of increasing levels of advancement that came along. Uh, surface irrigation is one where you just you have a slope on the field and you let water run down the slope across things. Um, but there are some much more you know, sort of high-tech ones nowadays. Um, really, the things that enabled that were sprinklers, piping, pumping, and um, so sort of the most common nowadays is, is drip irrigation, where you run a, a small pipe along the base of the crops, so it's just above the surface of the ground, but sort of below the plant, because um, you, you don't want to be watering leaves, you want to be watering the base of a plant, generally. And that's because, you A, it's a waste of water, leaves don't need the water, and B, it can actually um, make the plant more susceptible to diseases, so... yeah. And um, so, yeah, so having these little pipes running along the base and, and just wetting the ground. Um, the problem is there that the sunlight can, can heat that water and, and it evaporates away. So what's become popular more recently is sub-irrigation, where you try and drive the water directly into the ground, below ground. Um, so uh, that's a, a sort of a cool, more recent development. Um, there's also using various like uh, forms of cretinery. Like, um, so you have sprinkler irrigation where you have these structures overhead that spray water down. Or, or you have the sort of movable, um, what's that one called? Uh, lateral move irrigation, where you have a, a, a sort of single structure that moves around and then has to be moved to another part of the field and then moves around and covers a small area. In greenhouses, these are called booms. I don't know why, but they literally, they do the same thing. They just move back and forth across the greenhouse and water the crop. Yeah. For some reason, they're called booms. 
And then you also have the sprinkler irrigation and center pivot which are quite common in the sort of flat plains of the Midwestern US where you have this just huge flat field and you can just have a thing in the middle spinning around and firing it in every direction. So um, you know, these all make dry arid areas, areas better suited to growing crops. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So that's one way in which people are using water to grow food. The other way that I wanted to touch on briefly is called hydroponics. Um, and hydroponics is basically where you don't have soil. You grow the plants in either a medium or you just suspend them above a tank of water with nutrients in it, um, usually with like a foam board or something. You can have soilless medium as well. There are types of foam. There's a substance called rock wool that you can reuse. Um, but there are a couple of reasons that you would you would do this. Firstly, if you want to, I mean, soil is heavy uh, and it can be difficult to transport if you want to grow inside and have things really strictly under control or if you just live in an area where there's not much space for it. Um, also for growing plants in space, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but, uh, basically there are any number of reasons why you might want to grow plants without soil, whether that's to, uh, stack different rows of crops on top of each other. It's called vertical farming, um, or to grow things in a city or whatever. Uh, and all of these use hydroponics to do that, some form of hydroponics. Um, and the other useful point of hydroponics is that water that goes through the system is recycled. That does create a challenge because um, waterborne diseases can spread pretty rapidly throughout the crop. And because you've got nutrients in the water that the plants take up some of them and you don't know exactly how much is left. So you have to figure out how much to replenish with. And so it's a whole balancing act that people are really starting to um, hone in on and get better at uh, as this technique is developing. But it's really... um, it is a really useful innovation in certain circumstances. Yeah, vertical farming is something that excites me a lot because um, you know it's, it's in in this country in the UK we we have a relatively limited land and vast majority of it, like ninety five percent of it, is used for farming. Yeah. And um, and you know, if we can get some of that land for other purposes, you know, be that housing or you know parks for you know recreation and that kind of thing mm-hmm. um you know because at the moment it's just wall-to-wall farm fields and it, it takes up so much land and we could get so much more food and use up so much less of the countryside at the same time yeah the main challenge with vertical farming at the mm-hmm. moment is the power it takes to provide lighting because if you've got you know plants even if you're doing it outside or in a greenhouse you've got plants on top of plants and so the lower plants obviously aren't getting enough light and unless yeah. you're providing lights with leds uh, so that's a significant cost and energy draw at the moment, but that's what people are working on next. So yeah, I wanted to sort of step back into some other uses of water now. Um, sure. So you know, everything we've we've either been talking about drinking or eating mostly, and um, I want to talk about completely different ways that humans have used water to to their advantage to you know, improve flourishing. And um, and one uh, one important one which I actually won't talk about much is generating power, and that's because we kind of have some plans for a whole episode about generating power. So we'll talk about hydroelectric power and all that kind of stuff at that point. But his, you know, water as a source of power is not a new thing. Um, it's, it was very common in, in the sort of pre-industrial period where um, you know, uh, there was no way of generating power for a machine to run other than using nature. And that was usually either wind or water. Um, if you go around in European countries, you'll find a lot of water wheels uh, on the sides of buildings. So you know, they were using the movement of a river to drive the machinery in, in a mill or, or a factory. Uh, not really factories at that point, but in mills for producing flour and that kind of thing. So early on, it was used as a source of power. We'll talk about that more in, in the power episode. Um, but what I would like to talk about is what came after using rivers and, and wind for power, which is uh, the steam engine. So steam engines were originally, well, as the name suggests, you know, they work on steam. So water is pretty essential there. And they were originally developed really as static engines for running mills and factories. And then more famously now known as being railway locomotives and traction engines, you know, for, for moving things around. That was really down to the work of two men, Richard Trevithick and Robert Stevenson, and to some extent his son, George Stevenson, uh, who basically invented the steam locomotive as as a engine for moving. But Static steam engines were used throughout the 19th century and into the 20th as a way of generating power for cities, as a way of running mills and, and factories. Um, and actually, they're still really used as a way of generating power. A coal-fired power station is really just a giant steam engine. And um, 
And the way steam engines work is you have a firebox that um, you, know, you burn some kind of fuel in, usually coal, but also the Americans used wood a lot in, in their steam locomotives. And oil-fired steam engines are a thing. The countries that kept using steam into the 70s and 80s often used oil-fired steam engines. And, um, and around the firebox is a boiler full of water. And as the firebox heats up, that water turns into steam, it expands, it gets excited. And you can open a valve and it lets the steam into a piston piston has a head in it so as this side of the piston fills up with steam that pressure pushes the piston down the other end the head down the other end of the piston there's a valve at that end that lets the steam out and it pushes the piston back again so you know that forward backward motion a rod turns that to turn a wheel and that's how you get your wheel motion so in a static steam engine you're spinning this big wheel that runs all of your machinery uh, or generates power um, through an electric generator uh, in a locomotive usually there's rods coupling to a couple of different wheels and that's you know the more wheels you have the more attractive effort you have so that's how steam engines work but it's a completely physical completely mechanical thing so you know it's 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 kind of amazing like you know some people describe steam engines as being like living breathing machines because they have this you know, the, the the way they move and breathe is almost natural. There's, there's nothing electronic in there. It's just entirely physical processes and you're huffing and puffing to generate that motion. Well, and it's hard to overstate the importance of the steam engine because basically that's what brought on the Industrial Revolution, which completely yeah. changed how we live and completely um, skyrocketed our, our living standards. Yeah, it enabled mass production of, 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 of uh, objects through these you know, machines that are able to take over from one person at a time, you know, making some, knitting something, weaving something. And then it also enabled the mass movement of freight and people across countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So sort of on the flip side of heating up water to help it, for it to help us do things, uh, we have using water to cool things. So following the steam engine, um, we had the internal combustion engine, which is what's in most cars. If you have a gasoline or petrol powered or diesel powered car, um, that probably uses an internal combustion engine. The problem with yeah. the internal combustion engines, as the name suggests, is they do produce a lot of heat, and so you have to cool that. So early versions of this just used fans, and that wasn't really enough. Um, so most cars now use uh, coolant, which is mostly water with an additive to help it be better at what it does. Uh, and basically water goes into the engine block, which is where the engine lives, absorbs the heat, which it's really good at doing it, by the way, because uh, water has a really high specific heat capacity, which just means it can absorb a lot of heat. So it absorbs all the heat compared to other similar substances. So it absorbs a lot of heat, and then it goes out through the radiator where the air is flowing through, you know, through the car and cools down and then comes back and does it again. And so this is why you can, you can actually use water if you're out of coolant. It's not ideal for cars, but you can do it if you are in a pinch. Yeah, and, and your car will run better um, when you're low on coolant if you're driving at speed because the flow of the air coming into that radiator is, is helping versus yeah, yeah. just the fan itself running is not mm -hmm. doing very much. Yeah, but water really helps those run a lot better. Um, and then similarly, some computers are using water cooling. So like the computers we're using, I don't think, use water cooling. No, no, you don't, the water-cooled laptops aren't a thing. But they were, <laughs> so IBM pioneered the use of water cooling for computers when they had when computers were so big back in you know, the 60s that they filled a whole room they were producing a lot of heat and so water cooling was kind of necessary because water cooling is a lot more efficient than air cooling um and why, why is water so efficient at cooling because of the high specific heat capacity yeah. it can absorb a lot more heat than a similar volume of air can yeah. and and it's also a lot quieter yeah. <laughs> but um Obviously, there's a difference between computer and car cooling in that you can't just flood your computer with water. <laughs> you have to use little tubes that pipe the water around to absorb the heat and then cool it down and bring it back. Um, but it's the same basic idea. You're just using a tube in addition there as opposed to uh, just flooding it directly with water. And so IBM, like I said, was using that early on when we had these massive computers. And then as PCs started to be a thing and, and more and more people started to have computers in their homes and they got smaller, we didn't really need them so much. But now um, high-end computers, gaming PCs, things like that, are starting to be so powerful that they're reaching that level again of producing enough heat where water, water cooling again makes sense. And so some very expensive uh, computers and laptops are using water cooling again these days. So it's sort of, again, resuscitating an old idea um, for new purposes. Yeah, and, uh, and it's very useful if you if you're doing uh, like CPU intensive processes like rendering graphics or 
mastering audio mm. and it's also very useful if you're recording audio and you don't want a noisy computer fan in your audio um you know if you've got a good setup then your audio is somewhere else in a different room but you know if you're trying to do that at home then you know if you can minimize that noise that's really helpful for sure yeah. um but calling computers and engines is one thing um but what is also quite useful at calling power stations and uh, and uh, in particular nuclear reactors but the other thing that water is really useful for in, in nuclear power stations besides cooling is radiation shielding. And um, it's, very it's important yeah, uh, and I, I think we have such a, a misperception of radiation in, in public, I think, just generally. It's seen as being this kind of evil, like instant death, scary thing that, you know, you need tons of lead to, to block it and, uh, and, you know, radiation exposure is like instantly fatal and that's not true at all there's radiation everywhere all the time we're, we're bathed in it from the sun from the ground from our own bodies from nuclear power but relatively small amount of radio waves and that kind of thing and from other stars radiation is everywhere it's just a matter of how much you're exposed to and um, there's a really useful unit for that uh, which is the rem mm. so radiation is generally exp- measured in silverts or mini mini sieverts sorry um, but uh, rems is the measure of radiation impact on the human body so one REM um, is uh, increases your chance of developing cancer in your lifetime by about 0.05%. Uh, 100 REMs, if you're exposed to it in a short period of time, will cause acute radiation poisoning. So that just gives you a sense. Now, a nuclear reactor, uh, the one they tested for this experiment, uh, running with no shielding, uh, produces 5.3 million REMs. So, you know, that is a kind of instant death situation, if you're anywhere near that. Um, 20 centimetres of water around the reactor reduced that to 800,000. Mm. 200 centimetres, two metres of water around that, reduced it to 0.65 rems. So just over half a rem, um, if you're standing right there. If you've seen photos of water-shielded reactors, they're usually down in a pit, you know, sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 metres down. And, um, you know, with that much water... You're perfectly safe. You can stand at the top and look at the thing and watch it running, and it's right there. And it, it's it's weird seeing it in photos because you're, you're, you're actually just... There's people just standing there staring at it, and and they're completely safe. It's just there's that much water that it um, you know it's far more effective really than than building some kind of thick radiation shield out of a solid material. Um, the thing is, there's uh, water is only super effective with uh, particle radiation, which encompasses alpha and beta radiation. So there's two kinds of radiation: there's particles and, and waves. Alpha and beta is particles, and and gamma is waves. But you don't really need to get into the differences within those for this purposes but the thing is that the hydrogen in water blocks particle radiation really well the problem is it doesn't block gamma rays so well and when the particles of alpha and beta radiation hit the the water particles they actually produce gamma rays as part of that process mm. and that's not good because gamma rays are really the, the really scary kind of radiation so um, adding boron to the water and we talked about additives in, in cooling and in other things um this is another case where you know, we improve water's functionality by adding things to it and adding uh, adding boric acid um, so that there's boron in the water prevents that from happening. It makes it and uh, so you can thicken up the, the the thickness of the body of water to improve its uh, blocking of gamma radiation and then adding that boric acid stops it from producing more gamma rays by by that process. Excellent. So that's so cooling and radiation shielding are other uses that. Um, other ways that we make water work for us, basically, and, um, it allows us to help up what we can do. The other thing that has a historic background, and the other use of water, that is, is transport. So canals are the big thing. And this using canals for transport goes way back to the uh, 510, 520 BC, when the Persians had recently conquered Egypt. Um, and they built, they built a canal. This is the first canal that we have evidence for. Um, and that canal just connected the Nile to the Red Sea. So again, you can see sort of the idea of what are the bodies of water that we already have, and then how can we make that work better for us? We have these two bodies of water that we're already using. We need a connection between them. So people were you know, already using rivers and things, I'm sure, before that for, for transport, and this is taking it a step further. Um, another notable early canal is the Great Canal in China which is a bit confusingly named because similar to the Great Wall of China, it's not actually one canal. It's a series of connected waterways, many of which are canals, but it's still considered the longest canal in the world because altogether it's 1,800 kilometers long, which is like longer than the whole of Great Britain, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. The whole of the UK from end to end is about 1,200 kilometers. Yes. So that is massive. And it connects a village near Shanghai to Beijing, um, which is obvious, you know, major cities in, uh, in China, which are important for training purposes. Um, and that construction on that started in the 3rd century um, third century BC, I think it was. So, uh, And then the Romans, of course, as we were talking about, were really well known for their engineering and for their infrastructure. And so they also built a number of canals to aid in transport. They were mostly using it to transport freight um, because the main way that you could transport freight at that time was by ox cart. And oxes can only carry so much. Oxen, excuse me, <laughs> can only carry so much. Um, and so you could carry a lot more on a barge. Um, and depending on whether you were going upstream or downstream, it tended to be faster. And in any case, it was always cheaper. So that was a huge help to their economy was having canals to move freight on uh, at the time. Up until the steam engine, that was really the main way that you, you, that you moved freight was by water because it was the cheapest way to move a large amount of things. Um, but they all, interestingly, before you had steam-powered boats for canals, you were using horses to tow the barges. Yeah, so um, canals really came into their own in the 18th century, uh, first in Britain. And, you know, Britain's the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and canals played a really important part in that. Um, before steam engines took off as a mode of transport and, and railways became a thing, um, canals were the primary way of moving freight around in Britain, and a massive canal network uh, was developed by a number of competing companies in, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And um, the first of these was the Grand Junction Canal, uh, nowadays known as the Grand Union Canal because it merged with other companies later, but uh, that actually runs quite close to where we live, so I, I've spent a lot of time walking up and down it. And, um, and British canals and, and in other countries will have what's called a towpath, T-O-W. Not toes like on your feet, yeah. which is what I thought when I first heard this. <laughs> um, running alongside them. And that was so a horse could walk along there and drag the barge you know, with ropes. Um, late, latterly, steam engines and then diesel engines and now electric batteries um, appear on barges. But initially they were horse drawn. A funny little aside to that is that um, so, you know, when these canals were being built, you really had the re-emergence of civil engineering sort of what like we were describing with the romans before and some of this was tunneling because british canals followed contour lines so they stayed flat so you weren't pushing against a current you know it was it was flat the whole way which massively reduced that problem that the earlier canals had of you know it's easier to go downhill than uphill when you've got a um when you've got a, a current you're pushing against in a river or in a canal um, whereas these artificial canals um, in britain they were you know, they had no current flowing basically through them. There was a little from pumping stations, but basically none. Mm -hmm. uh, they changed level if they had to through locks where you had pairs of gates. But no, the funny thing is that these early tunnels to take the canals under, under hills and mountains and things uh, weren't big enough for horses to walk alongside the canal. So the horse would detach and go on a road over the top and then the men on the barge would lie on the side of the barge and walk along the walls of the tunnel uh, and um, you can actually do this at the Black Country Museum in, in Dudley. Uh, they have a section where the canal barge goes into a tunnel and, and you, you can ride on it and then you sit on the side and walk along the walls and push the boat along with your walking motion. So that's quite a funny thing. But um, nowadays, a lot of these tunnels are still in use 300 years later. And um, and Britain's canals have, since they are no longer really needed for freight, have become a, a leisure resource. A lot of people live on them. And uh, they're great for walking, and you, you hire barges and, and you know go for day trips or longer as as, as a way of having a holiday. So they've they've they found a new niche, and they've actually started recently rebuilding and reopening. And there's a lot of trust that are opening old canals up again as as leisure. And people do sports on them too, don't they? Like races and things. Yeah, um, that's more of a thing on big rivers, but yeah, they, you can you, you can do rowing and things like that on them as well. And they've become wildlife habitats as well, completely unintentionally. They just naturally have. It's there's, yeah, they're certain creatures that like to live in and near the water so yeah swans particularly <laughs> swans i've seen more swans since i moved to the uk than i ever had in my entire life before that um but yeah so that's kind of how water has been used and is being used and so looking forward a little bit this is still kind of how water is being used but um in space we're looking at you know how much water is there in space where is it and then how do we use water in space you know, for humans. Yeah, kind of jumping from the past to the future, but um, the problem with, with one of the problems, many problems with, with uh, you have to overcome in space flight is that firstly, anything that you have on a spacecraft, you have to have launched from the surface and water is really heavy. 
it's a large amounts of water. You you can't just I mean rockets have really limited lifting capacity. You can't just be launching you know huge tanks of water into orbit. So um, when you're in space, you you recycle all your water, which does unfortunately mean drinking water you've drunk previously. But you know you so um, space stations are uh, and spacecraft have water reprocessing facilities on them to you know reuse all of that water because you have to reuse everything because there's not there's nothing else for you to to use without sending up a, a supply craft with more on it um so the iss is resupplied from time to time by freighters but there's really limited you know, equipment they can carry and they're bringing up all sorts of other equipment and stuff so um you need to recycle all your water on, on a spacecraft fortunately um Space exploration missions have found uh, that the Moon and Mars um, have much more water on them than we previously thought. And um, ever since the Apollo and Surveyor missions in the 1960s, we knew that there was some water in the lunar regolith, but it was just in the soil and there's very little of it. But um, the Chandrayaan Indian spacecraft, uh, which had a NASA instrument on board, the Moon Mineralog Mineralogy Mapper, um, found uh, that there's actually uh, water ice at the lunar poles. Mm -hmm. So uh, the moon has no air, so during the daylight, the sunlight just bakes it, and then during the nighttime, it's freezing. So it alternates from hundreds of degrees above to hundreds of degrees below freezing. Um, so water can't exist in that environment. But at the poles, the craters at the poles are actually shielded from the sunlight, and there's enough water ice there to support cities of millions of people. So, um, so if we have lunar habitats, then they'll have ready access to water at the poles. Uh, Mars has even more. Mars has polar ice caps, but it also has a lot of water in, in, in the soil that the rovers have found increasingly. And there's probably more below that that we've not found yet, but we already know that it has at least 5.3 uh, million cubic kilometres, sorry, 5 million cubic kilometres of of water, which sounds like a lot. Like if you imagine... It certainly does to me, yeah. Yeah, but, imagine but... a cubic kilometre, how big that is, and then 5 million of them. Compared to Earth, uh, which has 1.3 billion cubic kilometres, it's not a lot, but Mars is a smaller planet and uh, it doesn't have surface oceans. And there may be a lot more in the soil than we know, but already it's enough, again, to support millions and millions and millions of people living there. So that makes the prospect of colonising other planets, um, you know, there might actually be a planet B if we can make that work. Um <laughs> Quick note that further out in the solar system, places like the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, some of those moons are actually practically made of water, Europa and Enceladus. Did you say Europa is one as well? Yeah, uh, Europa around Jupiter is known for having an under underground ocean. Callisto, uh, uh, other moons of Jupiter may also have that. And then some of the moons of Saturn, Enceladus in particular, um, almost certainly you know has a substantial underground ocean that you know, provides ready access to water. So once you get far out enough, it starts to become readily available again. <laughs> Which is harder to get to, though, of yeah. course. Uh, the other thing that people are using... Um, so we talked earlier about hydroponics and yeah. how there are a number of applications for them. And one of the coolest ones is space because soil causes, causes all sorts of problems when you have less gravity. Um well, not literally have less gravity, but... Uh, well, effectively no gravity. Effectively. Yeah, um, I mean, there's never no gravity, but on a spacecraft, there might as well be no gravity. And, um, and yeah, soil can fly into all your equipment. You don't want it you know, breaking up and going everywhere. Right, that would be one major issue. Another thing is, again, that's more free to bring with. And so they've been experimenting on the ISS uh, with growing water... Or with, oh, growing water. <laughs> <laughs> Not there yet. With uh, growing plants hydroponically so that you can have food in space, which would obviously be a major step toward um, having actual habitats on other planets or on the moon. You have to be able to grow your own food. You can't cart it all up there. Yeah. Um, and it's not as nice for the astronauts to eat dehydrated meals all the time. Yeah. yeah. So they've successfully grown a number of vegetables, uh, lettuces and peppers and things this way. So... Yeah, and the other issue that you have in, in space as well is that plants don't know which way to grow in zero gravity. Oh yeah, you need lights to help direct them. Yeah, so they've been doing an experiment on the ISS with using LEDs as a way of directing plant growth. Yeah, we're really just scratching the surface. This is you know, possibly a topic for another day, but we're really just scratching the surface on what we can do with LEDs. It's really quite impressive um, and really figuring out, especially with plants, what the relationships are between different wavelengths of light and how plants grow is really quite cool. Um, but I think that's all we have for today on water. So today we talked about um, the importance of water for survival and how humans have made that possible by cleaning water, uh, going all the way back to the ancient Egyptians up through some recent advancements in cleaning water. Uh, we talked about desalination, um, again the basic concept of that, and some recent advancements. Uh, you talked a little bit about step wells in India, uh, we talked about 
irrigation using canals and, and then all the way up through more modern techniques like uh, sub-irrigation and drip irrigation. Um, we talked about hydroponics, we talked about steam engines, we talked about um, using water to cool things and also using water to shield radiation um, from nuclear power. Uh, we talked about water for transport and we wrapped up by talking about water in space. So quite a lot of ground covered, even though it was water. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on Innovation Celebration. Thank you.